Kate Ahern. Uh, she is an assistive technology specialist focused on augmentative communication and uh, also has a small uh, private practice serving the Angelman and Rhett community. And we also have parents here who uh, she works with their children. So we're just thankful to have Miss Kate. So it's all hers. Um, so the, first, I'm going to apologize to the parents of the kids I work with whose kids are in the videos. So and I had to promise not to put people's laundry in the videos. Um, so before we start, I would like to read, have you uh, read a little social story to help us prepare for our experience today. Um, I prepared this especially for you so that you would have the skills you need to attend to this presentation. Hand out social story for fast. I am the parent of a superhero with Engelman syndrome. Every day I work hard. Sometimes I go to conferences or workshops. Those are short classes where I learn about things to make me a better superhero parent. Sometimes at conferences and workshops the presenter has handouts. Some people like handouts to write on and follow along. Sometimes the presenter does not have handouts. She may post her slideshow online instead. She may care about the environmental impact of all that paper. A lot of handouts end up in the trash. A lot of handouts are never looked at again. Sometimes I might feel upset that there are not paper handouts. I can take notes on regular paper or my mobile device instead. I know how to be okay when there are not handouts. I do a good job at conferences and workshops even when I am not happy about the handouts. I am okay. I always share that uh, with groups because a lot of times when I present, people get very upset that I don't provide paper handouts. And um, I've discovered that if I treat my audience like I treat my students, and I provide them with a social story before, nobody comes up to me and yells at me, which makes me very happy. So it's a win-win for everybody. So I'm doing two presentations, each of which should probably take about an hour and a half, but I'm gonna do both of them in an hour and a half together. So you ready? All right, so I have a requirement for the audience in order to, to make this work. This is my rule. Sometimes I pr present at the School for the Deaf back in Massachusetts. When I present at the School for the Deaf, somebody is interpreting what I say into sign language. Therefore, when I say something, the audience does not react. So I think that I've lost my sense of humor, and they're a terrible audience, and then 30 seconds later they laugh. It's very disorienting. So all I ask of my hearing audiences is that you're more responsive than the deaf audience. We think you guys can all handle that? All right. So we're, first we're gonna talk about Angel Voices. Angel Voices is um, an AAC, community-based AAC group that we started in Massachusetts. Um, the way that it ended up happening was that um, we had a couple parents, I'm going out of sequence in the slide. I love it when I start off with a bang and do everything backwards. Um, we had some families of preschoolers with Angelman syndrome who um, all wanted me to see their kid and I couldn't possibly see all of them because there wasn't enough time. So we thought I'd see them as a group. And suddenly that evolved into being, um, you know, so we did our first meeting in somebody's house for just preschoolers. Within the, the three weeks before we were supposed to have the next meeting, I had something like 11 inquiries from families who had kids with Angelman who wanted to know if they could be part of this. 
So we ended up moving to an elementary school gym, um, and that was a disaster. So the gym was not the right environment to run a group. Um, and the group continued to get larger, so we added another adult to help, and we moved to a rec hall at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and then eventually um, we moved to a disability service agency that let us use their space for free. And this year they weren't able to accommodate us, so we're at a YMCA in a classroom, which actually turns out to be a really nice environment for us. Um, so we've been doing our groups for about three years. We um, ended up expanding. The people in the Rett Syndrome community asked me why I wasn't doing something for their kids. So now we run um, a Rett group, and then uh, we start with a Rett group, and then we do an open group for any disability, and then we do um, an Angelman Syndrome group, and we do it about every three to four weeks. Um, each group runs an hour, and the cost is um, just $25 for family. Um, so because in both the general group and in the angel one group, I have some sibling pairs and I feel like the literal least I could do is have them just pay once. So it's uh, $25 per family. We also um, welcome siblings and include them in the groups. Um, and as they come, we have, um, especially in the open group that we run, we have siblings who return a lot over time. We even have some older teenage siblings who will come in and will volunteer to like be the person that is for, does the game. So like they'll leave the room and we'll hide something and then the kids have to give hints on where it is. Um, so it's, it's a nice family experience. The way that we run it is that um, is that parents come with their child and the parents act as the person who does the modeling during the group. So I run the group, but then parents work directly with their own child to model and to help the child participate in the activities. So why would I want to present about this um, to a group when the you know when Fast asked me if I wanted to present? Um, why did I pick this of all the things I could talk about? And the reason is because what has happened um, since I presented this a little over a year ago at the ASF conference is that people have started their own groups in their own communities. So we have families who are either in their own home or in, in a church basement or wherever are getting together three, four, five kids with Angelman or, or kids who just use AAC in general and running their own groups. Um, and as this spreads, we're seeing AAC spread even further. And my message is always to get our kids communicating. So if groups are a way to do that, I'm all for it. Um, so the reason I present is to motivate families to go back to their own community and start a group. It's not that hard. It's totally a doable thing. Um, to provide information about what has worked for us um, and how you deal with a mixed group of kids with different abilities who are maybe using all different language systems. So you, maybe you have a kid using touch chat and a kid using Proloco and a kid using Pod. How do you make that work if you're running a group? Um, and the idea of the groups is we're promoting robust AAC. And I noticed um, this morning that some people sort of had a blank look on their face when we talked about robust. Um, so I always joke with Mary Louise that when I present after her that I have to change my slides as she speaks to take out things that she said that I was going to say and then add in things that I'm like, oh, I have something to add to that. So I changed the slide during Mary Louise's presentation. So how I define robust AAC is first of all, it has consistent placement of buttons for motor planning. So the button for want is in the same place no matter what page you're on. So you're able to learn where things are, much like you touch type or dial a phone. Everybody hold up your hand. This is the deaf audience check. You're all with me. Good job. Um, keep it up. I just thought I wanted to see if you could wave. All right, I want you to dial your first phone number. This is an age test. All right, how many of you could do it? Right? You don't have the numbers in front of you, but you're able to dial the number because you have muscle memory of where the numbers are on the phone. So you don't even really have to think about the number that much. You just know what the motions are. I know I'm aging myself. I should 
I don't actually think I can dial my first number on a touchpad. Um, so motor planning. So that's what we want on their devices. The button is always in the same place. It's not going to move around on them. Uh, we want an expandable vocabulary as the child's abilities grow with communication. So we want e either through masking or through changing how many buttons on a page, we want to be able to have the system grow. We're not, <clears throat> we're not big fans of starter AAC um, because the problem with starter AAC is eventually you have to drop it and switch to something else. So we you know, make a plan with the end in mind with a big enough system that we can grow it. Um, grammar is supported. That doesn't mean your kid's going to use grammar today. Doesn't mean that you need to use it when you're modeling. But you don't want to get five years into this and discover your kid's ready to start using the past tense and there's no way to do it on their system. So it has grammar built in. The alphabet is available to spell. The only way your child can truly say anything they want is by spelling. There are over, I think it's, I, for, I used to know the number, but there are like 100,000 words in the English language. And the most robust systems hit maybe 4,000 of them. So without spelling, there's no way your kid can have all the words, as we like to say. So you've got to have access to the alphabet and spelling. And then you also need some pre-programmed whole messages for fast-moving social situations and emergencies. You do not want to have to type up, type out, you know, my phone number is in an emergency when you need someone to call your mom because you're lost. You want a button that just says it. If you think you're going to have a seizure, you don't want 15 hits to say, I'm going to have a seizure. You just want to be able to say it because there's no time to waste. So having those full messages for anything fast moving or that it's an emergency, and then core words. So those words that are the most words we use in our language. So Angel Voices has been designed to support kids and families who are learning to use robust AAC using the definition that I made up, which is a neat acronym, by the way, Mega PC. Your talker should be a Mega PC. Um, so how do we share information about the group? We've never once advertised our group. It's all been word of mouth. Um, but we do have a private Facebook group where I post about when we're having sessions and if it looks like it's going to snow, we have lengthy conversations about whether or not we're going to meet when it's snowing. And um, any photographs we take or projects the kids do, we post to the group. Um, so that's how we communicate. Please don't go ask to join the group. It's for people who are going to come to the group. So if you live in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, or Vermont and you want to come down, by all means join the group. If you live in Nebraska and you're not planning a trip to Massachusetts, <laughs> if you could leave this group for uh, the parents who are going to be there. Um, but as of yesterday, we um, have our own website, aacvoices.org, uh, no, .com. I think it's .com. I should know that, but I don't. Um, but it went live yesterday, which is very exciting. It's really an ugly website right now, but it's up, so to start. Um, so let me just tell you about what we've done for the past three years that we've been doing this. So the first year um, after we had our first couple of meetings where we just grew so big so fast, we divided into two groups. We had a younger group, and then we had a tweens and teen group. The younger group was run by an SLP who um, I hired to work with me. And I did the modeling and behavior support as she ran the group. And the older group was supposed to be me running it and her supporting it, but it ended up just being me running it, which was fine. Um, and we had the parents participate to model. And for the little kids, we did um, usually some singing, a sensory activity, and then music and dancing. And for the big kids, we usually did a shared writing activity and a game or a craft, and then, of course, music and dancing. Um, the following year, we moved locations. We got um, a much more consistent group of people who came. Once we moved, um, the setup was the same, but the speech therapist I had hired was not able to continue with us at the new location. So I ended up running both groups. Um, and I do have a high school student who helps, a 16-year-old who helps with things like making sample crafts and stuff at group. 
Um, and typically in both groups, we typically sing, we do some writing, we read a story, um, we might do a craft or a game. Um, and what we saw with the more consistent attendance of the various kids was that um, they came to really anticipate the routine and to get also, I would hear from parents that they drove by the exit on the highway where group was and their child, oh, they would you know want to go to group even if it wasn't a day for group. So the kids seemed to be really looking forward to, to having group. One of the best things I, I think about how group has worked out is that the way we sing our hello song is able to give me a bit of an indicator to um, how the kids are feeling about group. So to sing hello, we go around the room and we have a child to pick up. Uh, we have each uh, participant pick a style of how to sing so they can say their happy style, mad style, silly style, Santa Claus style. Santa Claus style is the one that happens a lot, as you can imagine, um, even in July. Um, so all these different styles that we can sing in, and then we create an action and a sound, and we just sing, you know, hello to so-and-so, hello to you, hello to so-and-so, and then we do the action. Um, so at first, we would get a lot of scared style and mad style and loud style, and now you go around the table, and it's almost all happy style. Every kid wants to sing happy style or excited style, um, and then they all want to sing sad style at the end. So to me, that's an indicator that the kids are really enjoying group. Um, so this year, we've combined back to having all ages in one group. Um, and that's just so I can do three groups in one day to be able to do the Rhett and the Angelman and the general group. Some of our older kids um, double dip, and they come to both groups. So they come to the open group, and then we have a 15-minute um, break, and then they literally do the exact same activities with the Angelman group and they participate twice and they love it. So it's fine with me if they come twice. Um, so now we, we still do the, um, the singing and the story and the writing activity and then we use our music and our dance. Um, and we, we have, do have those kids who attend both groups. So each year we've set themes and that makes it easier for me to figure out what activities to do. And it um, seems to really help some of the kids if they know what we're going to talk about. So um, this past group that we had last weekend was Thanks a Minion, like the Minion movie. And we had, um, at the open group, we had one girl come in with two giant Minion stuffed animals and was just so happy to, to have them there and, you know, to bring them as part of the group. And since I know the kids better now after three years, I can pick themes that I know the kids will find exciting. Um, so the first year we started with music and movement and getting to know you and that's when we were just figuring ourselves out. Um, and then we did winter, which was you know pretty general. And then we did some Dr. Seuss stuff and poetry stuff and St. Patrick's Day. And then we talked about transportation because we had some kids who would like trains and stuff. Um, and then we did in May, Mother's and Mother's Day, and in June, Father's and Father's Day. Um, the next year, we did um, a Thanksgiving group. And you can see one of the activities we did that year was we made these long-legged turkeys. And then for our writing activity, we did a group poem, shared writing activity. So the poem was, I'm a long-legged turkey, and I'm worried as can be. Please eat some but don't eat me. And the kids all supply different foods that people should eat instead of eating the turkey. So macaroni and cheese, jello, ice cream, cucumbers, french fries, whipped cream. Um, <laughs> uh, the mom of the kid who said whipped cream is, is signing whipped cream the way her daughter does in the audience. Um, whipped cream. So, and that's the kind of activity that, that we do. It's simple, it's error free. Um, even if you're a very beginning um, user of AAC, you can come up with an answer on your device. Um, so that second year, we did Thanksgiving. We did Let It Go, which was about letting go of anxiety. I mean, it was off, you know, the whole Frozen thing, but we mostly talked about what we're scared of and we're going to let go of. We talked about books. We talked about love. We uh, wrote little love letters, which was really adorable. Um, we talked about luck, and then we talked about my world, my family, and summer. And then this year, we're um, 
we've had three groups so far. We've done Pumpkins, Go Away Big Green Monster, the, um, the book, and then Thanks a Minion that we just did. Our next group will be Penguins, which is um, pretty much planned out so far. Um, we're going to do some penguin bowling. It's going to be awesome. Um, maybe messy if I go with the whole whipped cream bowling thing. We'll see. I haven't decided yet. Um, pets, cars, uh, weather, poetry, uh, Inside Out and Feelings from the Inside Out movie, and picnics. There's a little poster we made after the big green monster one with some of the pictures of the kids in the group um, and the different things we did. So this typical schedule is the kids arrive. We always have like um, big chunky crayons and paper out because, you know, sometimes kids with angel wing syndrome aren't that awesome at waiting. Um, <laughs> just sometimes. And then we sing our hello song and then we have a story that's tied to the theme. Um, and then we do either a craft or a game. I always have both planned. Um, and I feel out the audience to see which way we're going to go. Are they in a mood where they can sit and do a craft and maybe have scissors around? Or as a group, are we in a maybe no scissors kind of mood? Um, <laughs> so we actually only have three pairs of scissors at group. So one of the big things is my teenage volunteer is in charge of the scissors. So if you want the scissors, you have to go over to her and ask her for them. So it adds this whole other layer of communication and safety to, uh, to the activity. And then we have a sensory break, which is typically just music and dancing. And then we do our shared writing, and then we, we sing goodbye the same way that we sing hello. <clears throat> Um, so why do we do all these things? I'm going to rush through this because I want to get to the behavior presentation. Is that okay if I start leaving stuff out? Everybody's down with that? Okay. Feel bad for you live streaming people. Um, well, I guess none of you are going to get the content, so I don't feel that bad. <laughs> so the goal of hello and goodbye is, of course, greeting each other to come together as a group. Um, I think the predictable routine is really very, very helpful. The kids know when they get their... We're going to color, and then we're going to sing hello. Um, and we also teach describing words because the kids pick a style, and then we act out that style. So if they say, I want to sing it happy style, we all act happy. So we, you know, hello to so-and-so, yay, or whatever we're going to do for an action. So they get to pair that action with the describing word they picked. Um, and then we go into our music and dancing, and that's, you know, mostly for sensory reasons but also for requesting and commenting and directing others. Um, it's a time when with some of the groups, we're you know, working on things like, you know, I need some space while we're dancing um, is something that we can talk about. Um, and words like wait and that sort of thing. And it's also you know, very motivating when the kids start to get dysregulated and I say, well, we're gonna just read three more pages and then we're gonna do a music break usually they're able to get through the end of that activity. I can also pick the last song so that it puts the kids at the level of energy I want them at. So if I'm going to do something quieter, I can have the last song we listen to be something quieter to help move them so that they're settled for what we're going to do. But if I'm going to do something a little more raucous, I can, I can get them pumped up with the music. So some of the things we might do is vote by letter for a song. So that would be simply, I'll just have uh, two letters. So I might have um, S for Santa Claus is coming to town, or um, Y for YMCA. Which one do you want to listen to, Y for YMCA, or S for Santa Claus is coming to town? You'll notice I don't, when I do that, have a none of these, because we're voting, not choice making. If it's choice making, you say none of these. This isn't a choice. This is like the presidential election. Those are your four choices, and that's it. It's not a choice, it's a vote. So same thing with voting by letter. Um, and we also take suggestions from them using their talkers. In the last session, so after three years, this is the first time we've seen this, we had kids suggest other kids' favorite songs. And that had never happened before. And it was really, really awesome that the kids remembered what song their peers liked, requested it, and pointed at the peer. And it happened a couple times. 
Um, sometimes we'll play like a pass the object game. So I'll start the music, we'll pass something around, and then when the music stops, you have to perform a task. So like when we did pumpkins, we passed pass the pumpkins, and when the music stopped, you had to write your name on the pumpkin. So a little bit of literacy hidden into our music activity. Um, and then we do lots of action songs, everything from, you know, YMCA and Gangnam Style and Whip It and Nay Nay to, you know, more traditional uh, little kids songs. Although all we ever do is, there's a video. know that song? Nobody joined in the chorus with me. Go. So here's us uh, letting go. listen to them laugh all day like if you're in a bad mood that video is on Facebook you should go find it that's what I do I go watch it listen to listen to it once I'm like hey, I'm a little better listen to it twice and then I just I have to laugh um sometimes we do actually I don't do sensory recipes I have some sensory defensive issues <laughs> sensory activities are not my thing Tanya, who you saw in the video, Tanya used to do all sorts of sensory activities. I, yeah, no. But if you're going to run a group, you could do it if you don't have the sensory issues I have. Up. I'm Grab the spoon. You do so it with this me? is us making a go. sensory recipe. Um, I can't do it by myself. I feel smooth. Yeah. Stir. One. So you can hear me modeling. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Oh, Maybe done? we should go faster. You yeah. done? Only six. Oh, all done. done. Okay. done. Okay. okay, all done. All right. So that would be a sensor. I think they were making Play-Doh, and I think most of it got eaten. But you know, it is what it is. Um. Stop again, right here. Oh, different. You can get something different. Here you go. Oh. So one of the things we do a lot of um, is uh, these communication temptations. So we might have the thing we need in a bag, and then you know we can spend 50 minutes talking about the bag and what does the bag sound like when we shake it, what should we do with the bag, and then somebody manages to say, look. So we let them look in the bag, and then they reach in for something, and we go, no, you said look, not take. And then somebody asks to take something, and you know, by the time you get everything out of the bag, the group is over. So I think sometimes people think they have to plan all this stuff. You don't really have to plan a ton of stuff. You just have to make the stuff you're doing have lots of communication components. Remember when I said I was going to go fast? I'm not what, quite sure what happened there. <laughs> all right, so here are some examples of the things we would do with sensory if I did sensory, which I don't. I do do writing. I'm big on the writing activities. We do lots of co-authored writings. Um, the kids use their AA systems to add words to whatever we're going to writing. Um, our goals are increasing the ability to do a tabletop activity, which is not a phrase I love. I think tabletop activities are overrated, but these kids are in school and we want their teachers to do literacy and their teachers believe they need to sit at a table to do that. So if I can increase their skills to sit at a table, I'm going to do it. Um, it, you know, we're supporting the pro-social behavior. We're promoting the idea that writing can be something you do for fun. The idea that if we write something down, it's permanent. 
that if you just say it, you said it, but if you wrote it down, you're an author. Um, and the idea that we are using um, our AAC in context, but changing the focus. So the idea that we can talk about one thing in multiple ways. Because a lot of our kids get very stuck. I have one little girl where we've been working for, I don't know, six months on answering the question, how was school? And she always says, naughty. Every time. And so one of the things I'd, I'd like for her to be able to do would be to answer with the word other than naughty, but also to know that she can talk about school in different ways. Um, I'd also really love to know what was so naughty at school, but she's not telling. Um, and then just increasing um, kids paying attention to other kids. So appreciating each other's ideas. Here's some of the things we've done. We've written about snow. And that was a simple one. Tell me what you think of when you think about snow. So totally error free. Any answer counts because it's what you think of. Um, and then we did some um, poetry in the style of Dr. Seuss, which was just the kids basically said anything. And we shoved it into a poem and made it, made it rhyme. Um, the kids wrote about their Christmas vacation. So everybody shared around the group about what they did during Christmas. Um, we do a lot of poems that um, are rhyming poems that have blank spots to fill in. So like this lucky one, I'm as lucky as can be. I'm so lucky to be me. And then with the kids were able to fill in, I'm lucky to, and different kids filled in the things that they felt lucky about. Um, that was, Samantha was the only one who showed up at group, remember? I don't know if I told you, last group only one kid showed up. And her mom called and was like, should we come? I was like, you better come. I'm all prepared to run this group. We did the whole thing. We sang hello to each other, just the two of us. We sang hello. It was great. But that was her writing about um, things she thanks a minion for. Um, so all sorts of different writing activities that we do. Um, here is one of the things we sometimes do is chant. We like to bang on the table in group. So this is one of our um, table banging activities. Or maybe it isn't. Uh-oh. Lies, all lies. You'll have to take my word for it. Books, books. I love books. I love to read good books. Books about... <laughs> bedtime. Bedtime and books about... Bags. I love to read good books, 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 books. Books. I love books. I love to read good books. Books about Mo the Frog and books about Piggy. I love to read good books, 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 books. That's enough of me singing. Um, games is something we're still working on. Turn taking, waiting. Those are hard things. Um, but we've been introducing games over time. Um, this past Minion Week, we played Catch with the Stort the Minion, where we just had a Minion. That was a group with just Samantha. So I mean, I ran it in the other groups, too. So more than Samantha played Minion Catch. But um, you just tossed the ball into the bag that had the picture of the Minion on it. And every time you got it in, you got a piece of a Minion for the next craft. So when you had the minion body and the minion overalls and the minion goggles and the minion eye, then you won and you get to put your craft together. Um, and then just all sorts of different games that we can play. Um, and then we do a lot of crafts. I think the important thing about the crafts is it's not about the child doing the craft. It's about the child owning the craft. It's their craft. They're the boss of it. If they don't want to cut, that's fine, but they decide how it looks and what happens with it. If they tell you it needs 15 eyes, then it gets 15 eyes. If they tell you that their minion has fluffy red hair, then we make fluffy red hair happen. So it's about it being their craft as opposed to making something that looks like everybody else's or, or following directions. Because it's a communication group, not an OT group. So we want them to communicate about what their craft should look like. So some of the things that have worked, um, when we added more sensory activities, um, sensory regulation activities to the group, it worked better. 
when we um, moved away from the sensory stuff to lower mess activities, for example, glitter is banned, um, things went better. Um, when we paid attention to things being too safe, so like no tissue paper that bleeds color, um, having uh, my visual supports and stuff ready ahead of time, paying attention to positive behavior support, um, you know, praising the kid who's in their seat and participating as opposed to the kid who's deciding to see if they can make the blinds come off the wall. Um, longer activities don't go so well. Um, messy activities that require cleanup don't go so well. Um, and when we got bigger than six kids, it was too big. Um, for spaces, a room with a table that we can move to make room for dancing is good. Accessible bathrooms is something to think about. Um, when we were in the Boys and Girls Club, we would use just bed sheets we bought on clearance to cover the computers, just so the kids weren't distracted by them, and it worked, sort of. Um, it's helpful to have Wi-Fi. Um, anything breakable, too crowded, too large, flickering sensory lights that hurt your eyes, all that sort of stuff, and needing to be quiet in the group to not disturb others, none of that stuff worked for us. And the second year we ran it, the cost of the space was more than what I was taking in from the parents. So I ended up in the hole for like a lot of money. And our regional um, Angelman Syndrome group kicked in $1,000 to help with that. And then I kicked in the rest and a parent helped kick it in. But we ended up losing a lot of money that, that year. So the next year we were really careful about how expensive the space was. So some things that have happened is we've seen that um, kids are able to advocate for themselves to regulate their own anxiety. So I'll talk about Samantha in the next slideshow a little bit, but she has a button on her talker that says, too many people are here. And when she says that, we say, that's fine, sit wherever you want. So sometimes she sits in the doorway and she doesn't come all the way in but she fully participates from the doorway. And because she's able to advocate for herself and say, too many people are here, she doesn't pull anybody's hair, which would be what would happen if we forced her. So that ability for her to say, I, I can't do this, leads to a lot less problems in the group. Um, having sensory things, I, I have started to keep like, sensory squeeze balls and stress balls and certain stuffed animals that I know certain kids love in my box of stuff that I bring to group so that those things are available for the kids who need them. Um, you know, and also being able to look at the group and know that like these kids need to move um, and doing that as opposed to trying to force my agenda. Um, because if I try to force my agenda, we'll never get through what I want. Um, and what we've learned is, you know, parents are willing to drive a long ways to come to these group. Um, the kids really thrive in this environment that we've set up just for them. Um, bad weather and really good weather really affected our attendance, um, especially that year that Massachusetts had nine feet of snow. Like, the spring of that year, nobody came, and I don't blame them. We have been inside way too long. Um, and then, so the, the hard lesson was about the cost that second year. Um, at the end of year one, we saw all of the regular participants were able to move from a light tech to a high tech. So we saw a lot, and I'm not saying the group did that, but it happened in correspondence with parents and home and family and schools. Um, a lot of the families started noting that their child was much more participatory in group than any other environment um, because they felt they felt were comfortable there. I think the parents connected with each other and also shared local resources. And that first year, all three of the regular attendees in the older kid group went away, um, with their families to a family AAC camp in Maine. So it was sort of a nice continuation when they moved, when they came to camp. If you decide you want to start a group, um, you you don't need to be a professional to run these groups and they don't they can be structured or not structured or however you want to do them um you can have a group with two or three kids it doesn't need to be you know eight kids to be a group 
Um, a neutral space seems to work better than someone's house. Um, you need to go easy on yourself. Sometimes activities don't work or everybody cancels or, you know, stuff happens. Um, so you need to sort of be gentle with yourself as you run the group. They're not going to be perfect. Um, and you wouldn't want them to be because the fun is in all the crazy not perfect stuff that happens. Um, and everybody, kids and families, gets better at participating in the group the more they come. Um, one of the great things that we've seen the, this year is we're seeing lots and lots of dads um, bringing their kids to group, which is a big change because it was all moms before that. Um, and I, I love having so many dads um, in the group with their kids. And that's where you can find the handouts if you want them. Um, but in the interest of getting to the presentation that I think people actually more want to hear, I'm going to switch over to that.